Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome uh, to this Quadrant Chamber's special seminar on the new BIMCO Supply Time 2017 form, launched exactly one month ago, on the 6th of uh, June. We're very privileged to have as our chairman this evening uh, Grant Hunter, Head of Contracts and Clauses at BIMCO. Uh, you may not recognise him from the photograph in the uh, handout. He's in his summer look. Uh, um, and he's uh, shaved for the event. But he is the man responsible for the development, revision and promotion of the BIMCO stable of contracts and clauses. So thank you very much, Grant, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here tonight and also to step into the lion's den as the five of his critique, in a constructive way, of course, uh, the latest version of the supply time form. Our thanks also to Chris Kidd of Inson Co and Robert Gay of Hill Dickinson for joining our panel. They need absolutely no introduction. Both have got considerable experience uh, and deep expertise in the supply time form, with Chris in particular having been part of the drafting time, uh, team for the 2017 supply time and also of the wind time form before that. We had also hoped to have Paul Dean of Holman, Fenwick and Willen. Oops, I mustn't call them that anymore. They've rebranded. It's HFW uh, with us on the panel this evening. He's another veritable supply time guru, but unfortunately he's travelling and can't be here. But he is here with us in spirit because the title, if you, whether you like it or not, was his idea, Evolution or Revolution. And last, but in reality first, a very big thank you to JLT for hosting this event so generously. JLT, as you know, with its litigation risk management team, are leading brokers in the burgeoning field of litigation funding and AT insurance, and we're very grateful to them for having given us this magnificent auditorium this evening and the reception afterwards. So without any further ado, welcome, and I hand over to Grant Hunter. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Uh, I would point out I didn't shave specially for this event. It took place some time ago, so otherwise I have a white mark around my chin because it's been sunny. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here this evening. I mean, the ink is barely dry on Supply Time 2017, and here we are talking about its first real public airing that it's had since it's been published. And it's fantastic to see so many people interested in the work we've done. It's taken nearly two and a half years to do it. Uh, it's been a very thorough process, we believe. But a very important part of it, in addition to the work that the actual drafting team did, was that we went out to the industry, we consulted with them, we sent out draft copies, and we got a lot of really useful comment and feedback uh, from the industry, including uh, a lot of the people on the panel here this evening. We didn't take on board every single comment and suggestion, but we certainly looked at every single one. Um, and we think, as a result, personally, as a, a subcommittee, as a group, um, that we're very pleased with the, the, the final product. Um, that said, I'm obviously a little bit nervous this evening, so it's quite a distinguished panel, and I'll be very interested to see what they have to, to say about it. I think Simon has already done the introductions. Uh, in terms of the format of this evening, we're just going to do a series of short presentations. Each of the, spect uh, each of the uh, presenters will take on a different aspect of uh, supply time. I've been told they've got between 10 and 12 minutes each to do this presentation. I've looked at some of the uh, slide sets and boy, some of them are going to have to talk really fast to fit all that in, in 10 minutes. So what I thought I'd do, I'll give each of you 10 minutes and after 10 minutes I'll look at the audience and if you look spellbound, you get an extra two minutes. If they're shuffling around in their seats, then I'm afraid you're going to have to sit down. So we're going to start off now. First and foremost, we've got Chris Kidd, who is the probably nervous as me as well because he was on the drafting committee and was anxious to see what may be said this evening. Uh, Chris is going to give us a, an introduction, an overview of the changes to supply time. At the outset, having started out with the intention, uh, or at least one of the intentions, was to address some of the um, uh, commentaries um, on Supply Time 2005. It's certainly with some trepidation that I'm standing here uh, this evening bef before you and before some of the leading commentators on uh, the 2005 form. I can only hope that they will be kind uh, in commenting on, on what we have done. Uh, I'm also looking forward particularly to hearing what they have to say about the new form uh, and some of the suggestions that they have themselves made during the course of our consultation process because I anticipate they will doubtless be looking to see whether we adopted um, any of them. Uh, of course, one of the major dangers um, embarking upon a drafting exercise of this type uh, is if one does a good job uh, on it, one potentially becomes redundant um, because no further work 
uh, is generated from disputes, uh, and part of me is uh, therefore secretly hoping that others on the panel will at least identify something to give rise to disputes and further work for us in the future. Um, indeed, we had to recognise on some occasions um, during the course of the whole process that there were going to be some areas um, that in the course of putting together a standard form, uh, inevitably there are going to be some areas that is going to leave some fun for the lawyers in the future. Um, now, in addition to uh, tackling um, commentaries uh, on the previous form, uh, we also looked at um, some of the decisions um, uh, uh, past judgments, arbitration awards, um, uh, and also took into account development um, of clauses um, uh, which raised issues during pre-contract negotiations and during charter periods of, uh, 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 in themselves. Uh, and we were helped on the working group um, uh, by substantial experience from different people from different parts of the industry uh, with input into that process. Um, the overall fundamental um, objective was to achieve a more balanced uh, supply time, balancing the rights and obligations of the owners and the charterers. Um, so where an issue or clause was identified um, as having been imbalanced, um, then we looked at it, we reviewed it, uh, and, and as necessary sought to remove the bias and reflect as best we could the allocation uh, of risks that are usually negotiated. Um, and although the um, offshore sector is obviously facing a severe downturn um, at the moment, we tried to be market neutral. Um, uh, uh, the idea being that BIMCO's forms are market neutral and don't reflect the current state uh, of the market. If the forms are to be durable, uh, then they need to be market neutral. Now, at the very heart of uh, supply time, of course, is the knock uh, for knock clause. Um, we decided at, right at the outset that this should remain uh, as a main feature of the contract, but the objective was to try and present it in a more clear and, and balanced uh, form to make it more attractive to charters. There have, of course, been pressures from uh, major charters um, in the market to move away uh, from the knock-for-knock, -knock. and over time we've seen erosion of knock-for-knock -knock clauses with various carve-outs um, and exclusions uh, and in introduction of various exceptions. Um, but we felt at the outset the clear-cut allocation of risk in the knock-for-knock, -knock, which has worked well uh, in the offshore oil, oil and gas industry over the past 40 years or so, uh, should continue. Uh, and it's this high-risk um, sector that the knock-for-knock -knock uh, regime is, of course, in invaluable in keeping claims and disputes um, uh, down. Um, we aimed to treat both parties equally by removing um, pretty well most of the exceptions in the knock-for-knock -knock clause to create a purer knock-for-knock uh, -knock with a better balance. Um, others will deal with the few remaining carve-outs um, uh, that are in the form, um, but the removal of most of the exceptions uh, is balanced by the expansion uh, of the definitions of charters group and owners groups. Um, these uh, definitions now encompass um, all the parties um, uh, uh, which might be <coughs> suffering a, a loss and which uh, the owners and the charters will be liable to indemnify each other uh, in respect of. Uh, and to give a pictorial representation of how these definitions have expanded the scope of the knock for knock. Uh, in the handout, and I appreciate the handout may be um, unfortunately a bit too small, but you'll see on the screen a pictorial representation. Um, the, um, ch char the elements of the charters and the owners group under the 2005 form are the boxes there in, in grey. Uh, and the boxes in red were the um, different potential contractors, subcontractors, co-venturers, etc., which weren't covered by the 2005 form definitions. The new definitions are wider uh, and uh, therefore potentially the scope of the different groups is now much um, wider. So what else um, did we have? Um, new clauses um, have been also added um, to deal with the fact that uh, in this day and age, uh, on support vessels, very usually um, f 
fuel systems are, are common, so bunkers uh, and the fuel that's been carried uh, out to platforms and so, so on are usually in, in the same system. Uh, so the, the new clause um, reflects that. We've updated provisions dealing um, with um, payment for fuel uh, and liability for engine damage, a major change there. Um, uh, it, we completely change who bears the risk of uh, damage to the uh, engine or the vessel as a result of uh, off-spec fuel being provided. Owners now uh, bear that risk and it's not a carve-out from the knock-for-knock -knock provision as it was uh, under the 2005 form. Um, expanded provisions included uh, as well dealing with um, on and off hire surveys. Um, audits, inspections uh, and assessments which are very much a feature of um, everyday life uh, these days um, in the offshore oil and gas uh, uh, industry. Much more uh, developed provisions um, dealing with those. Uh, there's a new layup clause as well um, in the 2005 form. The layup clause was very short. Um, uh, it's now much more developed reflecting the fact that putting modern vessels these days into layup um, involves a lot more. Uh, it, 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 putting a vessel into warm layup uh, involves quite a lot that needs to be worked out and agreed between the owners and the charters. The new clause sets out a procedure uh, for those discussions um, to take place and for agreements to be reached between um, the parties. The um, suspension and termination um, clauses, um, particularly the termination provisions, um, uh, Robert Gay has spoken on many occasions uh, dealing uh, with the termination provisions and the uh, unclear, inadequate um, notice provisions that were in the 2005 form. Uh, well, we've um, attempted to address that uh, in the new form and you'll find new provisions um, there as well. <coughs> The notice mechanism governing the exercise of the party's right to terminate for cause uh, has been reviewed um, and also that has been clarified. Uh, we've also um, included clearer provisions dealing uh, with maintenance days. Uh, the dry docking clause um, has also uh, been clarified uh, to deal with, um, to make it better for in terms of uh, programming and planning uh, for dry docking uh, and also the point at which the vessel um, uh, goes off hire and on hire uh, either side uh, of the dry docking. Uh, BIM codes up to date standard clauses um, have been included um, uh, together with some new ones as well dealing with sanctions, designated entities uh, and MLC uh, clauses <coughs> so they're already incorporated. Gone um, uh, from the new form are the both to blame collision clause uh, and GA clauses. The reasoning uh, behind that is that those, of course, are clauses primarily aimed at dealing with uh, cargo, <coughs> uh, and for the most part, usually support vessels aren't carrying cargo, so it was felt that there wasn't a need um, for those clauses to remain um, uh, any longer. Uh, and last but not least, um, Annex um, A, attached to the form uh, has also been modernised and brought a bit more um, up to date. Now that's a very quick um, overview. Um, I hope it gives you a flavour and some pointers as to where we might go during the course of the evening. Uh, and if I might, I should hand over to Grant. Thank you very much to Chris for just giving us an overview of uh, the, the main changes that we've done to supply time. What we're going to do now is delve in in a bit more detail about some of these key changes. Uh, and first up, we've got Simon Rainey, who's going to look at the very heart of supply time, the knock for knock and the excluded losses provisions. And he's entitled his presentation, Perfection at Last? Question mark. So uh, my talk is going to consider Clause 14, the knock for knock provision, uh, at the heart, as Grant has said, of the BIMCO supply time form, as it is at the heart of uh, um, all of the BIMCO suite of forms and I'm going to ask the question has BIMCO after much striving fa finally uh, attained perfection? There are six principal changes in clause 14 and I'm going to consider them as quickly as I can in the 10 minutes which I'm allowed. First of all the removal of the exceptions to knock for knock which Chris Kidd has just touched on. Secondly the expanded definitions uh, of who falls within the owner and charter group which is particularly important for Knock for Knock. Indeed, the owner and charter group started life uh, as an adjunct to the Knock for Knock clause. Third, attempts by the drafters of the clause 
to grapple with what is called the A turtle problem, and we'll come on to what that problem is uh, in a, a moment. Fourth, uh, finally getting round to decoupling excluded heads of loss from consequential loss and damage. Uh, uh, fifth, a, a wider treatment of the specifically excluded losses, quite a striking expansion of the scope of Clause 14. And sixth and last, and as gripping of, of all of the topics, the deletion of Clause 14F. Hands up those without looking at any presentations who know what 14F says. You, you must put yeah, your hand yeah, up. Yeah, you, you, you know. <laughs> So let's move to the first change. The first change is the removal of the numerous exceptions to knock for knock. Uh, and here is a pictorial representation uh, of what people thought the old 2005 form uh, looked like. A, a Swiss cheese problem. In other words, the incremental chipping away uh, of the scheme of pure knock for knock. If it's your ship, you pick up the tab. If it's my ship or my cargo or my, re my offshore unit, I pick up the tab. And the problem with the uh, 2005 form was that it had a long list of exceptions. And I was surprised when I was writing out this slide quite how long the list was. Uh, we've got, this is the first of two slides. You've got clauses exempting the charters, the owners for liabilities uh, and damage due to dangerous explosive cargo, cargo securing materials, contraband, uh, towing wires, bunkers, which is always an odd one because he, if the charter destroys the vessel, uh, through dropping something heavy on it, uh, he pays nothing. Whereas if he puts bad bunkers on in Nigeria, he, he pays for the cleaning and decontamination of the vessel. And then other ones, uh, ISPS and evading li liabilities. Second page, limitation of liability at law, pollution, salvage, GA, and so on. The charterer's uh, provision was never quite uh, as uh, eaten away like a Swiss cheese, uh, but that, ha uh, that had four uh, uh, exceptions. Here is a picture of the new clause, <laughs> smooth, pure, uh, uh, and without any holes in it. Uh, and uh, the, the quote there at the top, a knock-for-knock -knock regime where the loss lies where it falls at its purest, is taken from the explanatory notes that the aim was to make it as pure and as simple an application of knock-for-knock -knock as could be achieved. And so this is what the list looks like now. They've all been crossed out, except very, very few. Uh, towing wires, that remains for obvious reasons because they're fungibles, which is supplied for the operation. Limitation of liability at law, well that doesn't add anything to 14C anyway, but it's helpful to have it spelt out. And salvage of charter's property. In relation to the charter, the only ones that are left are again towing wires, plainly a burning topic in the uh, drafting committee. And wreck removal, the owner remains re responsible for lifting the wreck, even if it's got charter's stuff on board. So that's the first change. The second change is the expanded definition of who falls within which group. Uh, and this is where BIMCO has effectively tried to spread the net wider. That's what that picture is meant to represent. Uh, I just gave you a graphic demonstration of it there. Um, Chris has touched on this. The uh, um, group definition has been expanded now to cover charters, charters clients. Possibly it should have said charters clients and clients of charters clients. But they've added the words of any tier, which I suppose is meant to deal with that, subcontractors of any tier. And the, the intention there is to make sure that anybody on the owner's side uh, is uh, covered, anybody on the charter's side is covered, and to get rid of those arguments <coughs> saying, ah, yes, they're a contractor, but they're, but, they're, but they're, sorry, they're not a contractor, they're a customer. That doesn't fall within the group. All those distinctions have been swept away. Change number three is dealing with the A-turtle problem. And I need to pause a little bit uh, to explain why this is important. This is a picture of the A-turtle having had its problem, washed up on some South American shore, all buckled. This is the cause of the A-turtle's problem, the uh, grandly named uh, tug, the Mighty Deliverer. Uh, you can find this photograph on a website which is real, called www.uglyship.com. <laughs> and this has won the Ugly Ship of the Year uh, award uh, on that website. You can't actually see on the photograph, if you look at the full photograph, this tug has broken down and is in fact being towed. You can see a line out. Uh, uh, so uh, the problem was that she ran out of fuel halfway across the South Atlantic. I had to cut her towing line and the rig drifted off. The issue which came up before the uh, 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 judge was in relation to Clause 18 of the TOCON form, another well-known BIMCO form, which... Uh, it, it, includes loss of damage whatsoever nature sustained by the tow 
whether or not the same is due to breach of contract. Now, this was simple unseaworthiness, so it was covered by the clause. But Mr Justice Tier went on to, dis to discuss what would the position be if there had been a deliberate breach. Uh, uh, and because an example was uh, what happens if the tug owner says I've got a better contract I'm letting you go I I'm, gonna, I'm just going to breach the contract and rely upon the knock for knock clause a and the judge said no that won't work the knock for knock clause only applies so long as the tug owners are actually performing their obligations under the TOCON albeit not to the required standard so certain breaches will not be covered by knock for knock was what he was saying uh, the A turtle problem can also be seen in QDOS catering and Manchester Convention Complex, where Manchester Convention Complex apparently very cross about the standard of the volovans being provided by QDOS catering. That's, you can see that from the law report. Uh, decided to terminate the contract, but it wasn't a very good excuse, so it was treated as a repudiatory breach. The clause in that case dealt with liability whatsoever in contract, but the Court of Appeal read that down too and said, well, that can't mean any liability. It can't mean repudiatory, renunciatory breach. So it will only relate to defective performance of the agreement, not to a refusal or to a disabling inability to perform it. What was BIMCO's aim? You don't have to answer that question. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, the explanatory notes say the knock-for-knock -knock regime has been reinforced by expanding the description of the included causes of loss. The background to these additions is found in court cases since the A Turtle. That's all it says, unfortunately. So no further guidance, and the question is, was it intending to cover deliberate uh, repudiation, deliberate breaches, radical breaches of that kind? Let's see whether it achieved it. On the left-hand side, you see the old clause, which simply re referred to shall not be responsible for loss or damage arising out of or in any way connected with the performance of this charter party. The words in red in the 2017 form are on the right, connected with the performance or non-performance of this charter party whatsoever and in any circumstances, and then it goes on to include breach of duty and breach of statutory duty. duty. Good enough to cover a putative breach? Good enough to cover a renunciation? Well, it's pretty clear in terms of its in any non-performance whatsoever and in any circumstances. The difficulty, I think, is that the A-Turtle problem doesn't go away. In the Transocean and Providence case last year, the Court of Appeal obiter endorsed Mr Justice Tears' uh, comments on the uh, a clause which we're going to come back to when we look at another aspect of Clause 14 and said that it, uh, obiter Clause 20 in that case does not contemplate a deliberate repudiation of the kind, see the A turtle, and there may be other breaches on the part of one or other party to which similar considerations might apply. So the, 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 the uh, jury is out on radical breaches and when they're covered. Compare wind time, which was the most recent and most up-to-date and super, for, super version of BIMCO forms. Wind time, by Clause 16, specifically excludes the application of knock-for-knock -knock in a deliberate uh, uh, repudiatory or renunciatory breach situation. I've set out the clause there. I haven't got time to read it out. Uh, but that, that's interesting. In that knock-for-knock -knock context, they uh, apparently face, facing reality have said, well, we, it's going to be very difficult to exclude repudiatory breaches, so we'll take them out of the knock-for-knock -knock scheme altogether. And when one looks at cases like AstraZeneca and Marhedge, how explicit do you have to be? Not many people would sign a contract which says, you are liable for, 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 uh, for damage. Uh, in, sorry, I bear the liability for damage, even if you are in repudiatory breach of my contract. Change four, consequential loss. This is a picture of someone trying to rely upon the consequential loss uh, exclusion in the 2005 form. Optimistically, he says, loss of profits are excluded. Uh, and he falls down the gap because there's a socking great ball there of consequential loss. The ball and chain problem uh, is, as we all know, consequential loss in English law. It's not the same in Australia. But in English law, is very, very limitedly defined as being limb two of Hadley and Baxendale. So pretty useless for most uh, uh, situations. The ball and chain comes about because people say loss of profit, loss of use, and or including or other loss uh, such as consequential loss. So they link it together. That's where the ball and chain creates, is created. The supply time 89 form said including but not limited to loss of use after the use of the word consequential loss. The supply time 2005 form was meant to be an improvement on that. It didn't start very well because it used the heading consequential damages, not a good start. It, it then went on to say consequential damages should include but not be limited to loss of profit, 
ball and chain firmly established. And then it added the words in blue, whether or not foreseeable, and is that sufficiently clear to get out uh, of, the, of the cases? Some people are shaking their heads negatively. I would agree with that. That's the view I've expressed in the last edition of my book. And here is a, mem a picture of someone in the BIMCO drafting committee for 2005, not, of course, 2017, where everyone was happy, uh, 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 grappling with those two cases, ease, faith, and ferryways. The cases say, if you link it up in any way with consequential damage, you do so at your peril. So what's happened in the 2017 form? There is the full text of the, of the clause. Consequential indirect loss is put at the back after a list of specific use uh, of exclusions uh, and is no longer linked with any ball and chain. And the clause is now headed excluded loss. So uh, you have actually now uh, removed the ball and chain problem and that clause will work for those excluded categories of loss. Just look, at, at, before I come on to my next change, at little one and how long that list is of specifically excluded losses, direct or indirect. Because that's change number five uh, in clause 14, which is a much wider treatment of specifically excluded losses. Here are some fishermen pulling in a huge net. Uh, and when one looks at two aspects of the uh, clause 14 in its new version, one sees why BIMCO uh, say that it covers a, a wider scope. The first aspect is to compare 2005 with its very modest little list, loss of use, loss of profit, shut-in or loss of production. That's really all it said. With that huge list we've just seen. So you've got a much bigger uh, uh, set of excluded losses, and it mirrors the uh, commonly excluded industry losses in the logic form. In mirroring the logic form, it also excludes cost of use. Now, it, that, those words you have to look very uh, hard for, because they're tucked away in a long list of loss of profits, loss of use, loss of benefit. And those words came up uh, in precisely that form in Transocean and Providence, the Arctic Three, where Mr. Justice Popper well held that you had to construe the wording restrictively, and they didn't mean wasted costs. The Court of Appeal didn't agree. They said you had to construe the clause liberally. It does exclude wasted costs, and the Supreme Court refused permission. BIMCO plainly intended it to include waste, uh, wasted costs because the explanatory note says that it should cover wasted spread costs, and on the current state of the law, it will. The second aspect uh, of change number five is that uh, 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 the wording has been uh, beefed up in relation to uh, uh, arising out of or in connection with the performance or non-performance of this charter party. You've got a, a, a big slab of wording referring to breach of duty, statutory duty and unseaworthiness. But note uh, 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 a potential oversight, uh, two potential oversights. Firstly, this wording runs straight on from subparagraph two. There's no line break. And that's a point that was helpfully pointed out to you by Chris Kidd just this evening as we were gathering over tea and coffee. That apparently is just a typographical error and it's going to be corrected in the form. But otherwise, that might only qualify the uh, consequential uh, damage part of the clause. But the other thing to note is that the A turtle wording, which we've just seen in 14A, isn't here. So you are going to get an <coughs> argument, uh, just as happened in Translation and Providence, that while 14A might exclude radical and deliberate breaches because of that additional wording. There is no such wording in 14C, uh, and that is something which is slightly odd. Change number six, my last change, I was about to sit down now, I can feel Grant's eyes burning into my side, is a, a, a sad and fond farewell to Clause 14F. Given the fact that none of you knew what Clause 14F was, or at least were afraid to say that you thought you did, in case I actually asked you to tell me, Clause 14F uh, has been bid uh, 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 farewell. Here you see everyone waving goodbye. It was a hangover from Supply Time 89. What did it do? It, it, uh, of course, the uh, charter is liable for uh, uh, any loss of damage caused by his cargo, but if it causes the loss of the ship, then the owner bears that under knock for knock. A particular carve-out was made for hazardous and noxious substances carried on board the, uh, uh, carried on board the vessel. That was slightly odd because you could carry a hazardous and noxious cargo which then caused damage to the vessel simply because of the cargo, say it was carried in a big heavy box which was dropped. Would that then take it out of the knock for knock provision? And why was a special ex exception being made for hazardous and noxious substances? These uh, BIMCO drafters uh, couldn't really think of any reason to, to retain it as they said in the explanatory notes. This is but one risk among several others which does not justify special treatment and so it has gone in the pursuit of the pure, smooth cheese, 
uh, of a complete knock-for-knock -knock regime. So, uh, marks out of 10, what do we think? Uh, I couldn't then find a slide that had uh, someone giving marks out of 10. Uh, I think that actually this is a pretty good improvement uh, on the uh, uh, Clause 14 as it was. Uh, the A turtle problem is a problem which anybody drafting any exclusion clause is going to have because the court is always going to be reluctant to grapple with repudiatory breach. Apart from that little 14C, wrink, uh, 14B wrinkle of not having carried forward the A turtle wording, I think this represents a significant improvement. Thank you very much. Right, OK, so having looked at not for not, we're now going to look at some of the more uh, expanded provisions and the new provisions that we've put into uh, the supply time form. Uh, and as Chris mentioned in his uh, overview, uh, some of the things we expanded was the fuel provision, which was previously bunkers, but we recognise that uh, the fuel issue is uh, much more complex than it's been in the past, so we've expanded that considerably. Also looking at the surveys and audits, uh, that's uh, an expanded provision. Um, and then uh, finally, a brand new layup clause as well. And I'm going to ask uh, Gemma Morgan from Quadrant Chambers to talk about those. Dealing first uh, with fuel, um, I think the key aspects of change being firstly, as we've heard, um, the removal of the problematic subclause, which provided for charterers' liability for damage caused by unsuitable or off-spec fuels. Um, as we've heard, it's going much more in the direction of a very pure knock-for-knock -knock regime. Secondly, um, this has been a strengthening of owners' rights as regards uh, the ability to reject fuels. Um, and thirdly, I think there's been an attempt to head off, at an earlier stage, disputes arising out of the sampling and testing regime. And as Chris mentioned at the beginning, the fact that the clause is entitled fuel rather than bunkers uh, reflects the fact that a common fuel system is often in place for both the carriage of bunker, for the bunkers and the carriage of cargo. Um, dealing first with the um, delivery and re-delivery uh, quantity provisions, there have been, some, I think, some slight tweaks to make it a little bit clearer than the 2005 form. Um, the vessel has to be delivered with the amount of fuel stated in box 19. Uh, it now has to be re-delivered with no less fuel than the vessel requires to reach at eco speed uh, the nearest port where the specified fuel is available. The unclear 2005 wording, which also required about the same quantity as on delivery, um, has been removed. Now, under the 2005 version, um, as is quite typical, charterers purchase bunkers on delivery, owners buy back upon re-delivery, um, both being at the price prevailing at the relevant time and place. Now, I think this was felt by the committee not to reflect current practice for two reasons. Um, firstly, purchase orders are increasingly used, so price at the time of re-delivery or delivery uh, was not particularly apposite. And secondly, there's scope for debate on the prevailing price where at any given port uh, you may have multiple fuel suppliers. So now the parties have two options to choose from. Um, Little Roman 1 is the default provision, um, if there's no choice made, which is charters by fuel on board at delivery, owners by um, fuel upon re-delivery, and, and that's at the price paid um, by the other party for the fuel. Um, the alternative position, um, is, which can be chosen, is that the difference in quantity between fuel on delivery and re-delivery um, is settled between the parties upon the re-delivery and paid for either at the specified price, if a price has been chosen, um, or at the price which has been uh, paid at the vessel's last loading of fuel. Coming then on to 10D, which deals with loading of fuel, now to the 2005 version required only analysis by an independent laboratory. Now, uh, the samples must be um, analysed by an independent lab, and that analysis, as regards the characteristics of the fuel which have been tested, is now binding upon the parties. Now, I think this was to try and reduce the number of quality and spec disputes which evolve around the sampling and testing procedures, uh, but also to try and provide for a speedier determination of this sort of dispute. Still, there is no provision, so I might mark it down slightly on this, um, there is no provision which dictates how long the samples ought to be kept. And given, of course, that bunker problems often arise or only manifest themselves sometime later after loading, it may well be prudent for the parties to include um, a provision saying how long samples uh, ought to be kept. Turning then to uh, liability, um, the old Clause 10, as we've heard, was controversial. It placed liability upon the charterers for loss of damage suffered by owners as a result of the supply of unsuitable fuels or fuels which didn't meet the spec. So not only was it a carve-out in the knock-for-knock -knock regime, it was also quite unclear um, as what was meant by unsuitable fuels. 
It's generally thought to include fuels which were on spec, but which nevertheless damaged uh, the vessel's engine, for example, because of the addition of additives. But there's always a debate there as to what exactly unsuitable means in the context of an on spec uh, uh, fuel. It was also very difficult for charterers to know whether or not bunkers uh, would in fact be suitable. But the subclause has now gone. Um, to give some balance, owners' rights to protect the vessel from substandard fuel have been beefed up. In particular, Clause 10E gives owners the right to stop loading fuel if it reasonably believes that the fuel doesn't comply with the quality or spec, and the vessel will remain on hire during any stoppage uh, whilst the issue is investigated. And then you also have their Clause 10F, which retains the previous provision that owners are not liable for a reduction in speed or performance that results from fuel being off spec. <clears throat> so in terms of advice to owners, I suggest they need to be quite vigilant in terms of self-protection. Um, I'd say the chief engineer needs to be fully engaged with the testing regime at the time of loading to identify if there are any problems with quality or spec before too much is put on board um, the vessel. He also needs to be alive to his right to stop loading for further testing if he has reasonable doubts as to the quality. Now, the explanatory notes suggest that the chief engineer, um, in exercising um, his, his right to stop, must act in good faith, and I think that, that must be right. But it would certainly be advisable um, for his reasonable doubts um, to be documented, certainly um, in an email or a note of protest. Um, in order to protect their rights to be relieved for the poor speed performance due to off-spec bunkers, the same advice applies as under the re previous form, which is that owners particularly need to ensure that samples are properly taken, labelled and re retained um, in order to support any evidence for a claim at a later date. Coming on then to um, surveys, audits and inspections, under the 2005 form, um, I think two problems arose. Firstly, that it didn't really describe the required elements um, for the delivery and re-delivery surveys, and it certainly didn't deal at all with the important issue of audits and inspections requested by charterers during the charter period, which um, I think has been described as an everyday event. So there is now a provision for what needs to be incorporated, particularly in the delivery and re-delivery surveys. Um, but then coming on to 5B, slight typo in the heading there, but 5B, which deals with the audits and inspections. So this is quite a, a sort of detailed regime. Um, Pre-delivery, owners need to give charterers all the information which they reasonably require to conduct an audit survey or inspection upon reasonable notice. And then importantly... <coughs> Um, charterers, uh, sorry, owners are obliged to give full access to the vessel prior to delivery to enable charterers to carry out um, any audit. Now, this is potentially a very important provision. If utilised, it can avoid the common pro problem of the vessel upon delivery being said by charterers to not be as per contractual description or in a thoroughly efficient state. Such arguments regularly lead to delay in the vessel going on higher and disputes between the parties at the outset. A non-readiness upon delivery can also be a problem for charterers who have themselves chartered the offshore vessel uh, to a party down the chain who might consider the vessel uh, not to be suitable for their purposes. So the, the option there to have the pre-delivery survey is quite important. Um, now, the provision is, however, optional only, and I might suggest that parties might consider amending it um, to make the pre-delivery surgery mandatory. For the reasons I've given, it's an owner's interests if they can accommodate it pre-delivery because it can prevent delay in the vessel coming on higher. It's also in charterers' interests because it can avoid delay in their use of the vessel and can avoid potential problems down the chain. Now, charterers also have the right to conduct an inspection at any time during the charter period at their own cost, uh, provided they give reasonable prior notice. It's obviously a very valuable right for charterers, um, but one can uh, envisage significant potential disruption to owners depending on the circumstances, though, of course, um, these things happen at the moment anyway. Another valuable right for owners is that they, they have the right to effectively demand the results of inspections upon completion to make sure that they get to comment um, before they're submitted inadvertently um, to the databases. 
Um, coming on then to the uh, brand new layup clause. Um, now, previously, charters had the option of laying up. Um, hire was payable, but owners had to give credit for expenses and overhead saved. Um, but no detail was given as to how it was done. So this is a completely new and very detailed regime. And it's obviously a valuable one for charters in the current climate. It recognises, I think Chris said, that vessels rarely these days, particularly complex vessels, rarely go into cold layup. Um, and it recognises, and I think reflects, the fact that issues surrounding warm layup um, are far more complex. Um, and so the new clause seeks to identify the key elements upon which the parties need to agree um, before the vessel can enter layup. Now, firstly, um, charterers must notify owners in writing uh, of their intention to lay up, and they need to give details as to the date, the estimated duration, and they need to nominate a safe port or place. Owners then need to respond within seven days, which is potentially uh, quite a tight timetable. Um, they need to respond in writing. They need to say whether or not they approve, but they can't unreasonably withhold their approval. If they don't like the port or place that's been nominated, they need to provide an alternative. They need to give details of the nature and extent of the layup. And this is the important point. It's, this is for owners um, to determine exactly what needs to be done, given what charterers are requesting. They need to provide a reasonable estimate of costs of the layup. They need to detail the reasonable daily savings and the amount of reduction in hire as well. They also need to give a reasonable estimate of time and cost to reactivate. And that's part of the reason why I say seven days might be a little bit tight, because they've got quite a lot um, to, to think about and come back on. But you can see that they're, what they have to do is give a detailed picture as to what needs to be done and give charters a clear idea of what sort of costs they can inspect, ex, in, expect to incur. Once they've got that information, charters then have another seven days to advise in writing whether or not they are going to agree to the layout. Although it's not provided for, I suspect in practice at this point, um, there's going to be a longer than a seven day uh, window and the parties are going to engage in some negotiation. Because as we'll come on and see, whilst charters are required to pay the actual costs of layup and the actual costs of reactivation, obviously what's given in the estimate um, by owners is going to be something that charterers are going to want to try and, and hold them to. So I suspect that at this point there will be a little bit of backwards and forwards and negotiations um, as to exactly what the costs are. Um, hire is reduced from the commencement um, of layup, um, which is, I think, significantly fairer to charterers than it was uh, before. Um, but that is uh, fuel surveys and layup. Thank you very much indeed, Gemma. Um, so, where are we now? Three speakers down, two to go. I'd say <laughs> things are going fairly well at the moment. I'm quite pleased the way the direction's going. Uh, just to our last two speakers, we're drifting a little bit on time. Um, so, you know, just to keep as much as you can to the timetable. I know you've got a lot of slides in there. Our next speaker is the second Simon of the uh, second Simon of the evening. It's quite difficult to say. Simon Ferndal from uh, Quadrant Chambers, and Simon is going to be talking about our off-hire provisions and whether they remain fit for purpose. Yes, there you are. That's the title of my talk. Uh, the 2005 supply time form left unchanged the 1989 Clause 13, and for the last 10 years, I've been giving lectures on the problems to which it gave rise. Now, though, we've got a new clause. And in my view, it's a far better one. It even has the right title now, off hire instead of suspension of hire. Why not call a spade a spade? And why not call an offshore supply vessel it instead of she, as Clause 13 now does in the new dry docking section? I can't give a full talk today on this clause. There are substantial changes, and I can only cherry pick a few key points. But first, I want to uh, tell you a little bit uh, about what I think are important unresolved, perhaps insoluble, supply time off-hire issues. And the first is this. Whilst off-hire events and putting OSVs off-hire are commonplace, not that many OSV off-hire disputes emerge, and very few get to arbitration. And that's to my mind because equality of arms is more pronounced in the OSV sector than in any other. If an oil major says off-hire, when this is only barely arguable, then off hire it almost certainly is. Regional differences, as well as commercial power, are also key. In some parts of the world, you simply don't argue with, let alone show Clause 13 to, a charterer who puts your vessel off hire. And the actual words of the clause are probably pretty irrelevant. 
It's more about how a charterer reacts to an event than how the clause deals with it. Indeed, I think Lewis Carroll got it spot on. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Oh, the question is, said Alice, whether you can make, wor make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Second problem, it's a common grouse of charterers that off hire is not enough. When the vessel isn't working, they may suffer huge losses. But off hire is all they get. And as we'll see in a moment, one loophole in that respect, in clause 13b, has now been closed. And the new right of early termination for excessive single or cumulated off hire periods may prove a meagre remedy in that respect. And Robert's going to tell you, I hope, a little bit more about that new remedy if he has time. I would, though, urge charterers uh, and those who act for them not to forget to complete the new Box 32, or at least to try to get agreement on it. And my third point, there will always be gripes, however well drafted the clause, and apparent unfairness uh, on certain aspects. Surveys and investigations, for example. It's a major source of downtime. First, there's the plethora of surveys, mostly statutory, that extend time and disrupt port schedules. Off hire? I don't think so. Disruptive? Certainly. And then you've got post-accident investigations. Happen a great deal. Obviously off hire, I hear you say, and you're probably right. But in today's world, charterers' huge focus on safety and reputation massively extend the time and scope of such investigations long after the vessel is OK to work and technically again on, on hire. But still they'll probably keep her off hire. And finally, as introduction, it's still quite a narrow clause compared with cargo trade time charters. You don't have critical words such as or by any other cause whatsoever sometimes put in, sometimes not, preventing the full working of the vessel. And it's that additional wording which enables cargo trade charterers to put the vessel off hire for events such as maintenance and general repairs. And many believe that downtime for maintenance and general repairs is an off hire event under supply time. In my view, they're wrong. Look at the clause. So what have I chosen for tonight's shopping basket? I've had to be selective, and what I've picked is what you see on the screen. The first, second and fourth are important changes in the new form. And it means, of course, that I've had to go shopping, but I've left a huge amount on the shelf. And I hope it helps you, after this talk, that I've included a couple of slides of what I've not gone for, with a few remarks on them. I'm not going to go through them now, it's the subject of another talk, later in the year probably. And there's one slide, and there's another slide. You've got another half an hour of talk that I can't give this evening. So, what am I going to start with? Equipment breakdown. My industry informant, old friend Ian Perrett, tells me that breakdown of machinery and equipment is without doubt what causes most off-hire events. All the more surprising, then, that breakdown of equipment wasn't in the old clause. Now, I've been lecturing on this omission for 10 years, as I always thought it a tad surprising that time lost from breakdown of DP equipment wasn't an off-hire event. Anyway, it is there now, and if you or your clients still use uh, Supply Time 2005, please don't forget to amend, even though I'll bet that uh, OSVs have been off hire, put off hire arbitrarily countless times for breakdown of DP under the old form. And I very much doubt that many owners have taken the point that was staring them in the face. So that's my first point. The second uh, is, well, is the problem solved by the new clause? Well, maybe. But in today's world, a more sophisticated issue may arise, and we may need further bespoke amendment. DP2 is, of course, now commonplace. And so, with that redundancy, breakdown of DP equipment does not prevent the full working of the vessel. But many charterers simply will not take the risk of accepting a vessel entering into the 500 metre zone under their own guidelines or under statutory guidelines if a vessel is not completely operational and is operating, perfectly well it may be, on the backup system alone. Is there a breach of the due diligence to maintain obligations in Clause 3b? Possibly, but it's unlikely. Is Clause 
13 are clause here, 13a, engaged? Certainly not, in my view, but I doubt if that will discourage many charterers from putting the vessel off hire. Now, my next topic is deficiency of crew. There's no change here, but I want to mention it very briefly because it seems to me that it's an important pinch point. Deficiency means numerical deficiency as judged by flag state and IMO requirements. I doubt, I may be wrong, but I doubt that any OSV is ever deficient in that respect. But I suspect that OSVs are often arbitrarily put off hire under this head and that owners put up and shut up. When might it arise? Well, I've given a couple of examples here. The first is when charterers changed their advised schedule without warning. And delays arise because the vessel's waiting for the last couple of relief crew, say, whose flights couldn't be brought forward, off hire or not. Full complement of crew already? Yes. Off hire? Probably not. But I'll bet many charterers will put the vessel off hire while waiting for those crewmen. Second example, and a rather important one, I think, is when a vessel is sent to a part of the world where there are special local requirements for additional personnel, Saudi or Brazil, for example. Uh, again, I'll bet many charterers will wrongly, but it'll be accepted, put the vessel off hire while idle, waiting for those additional personnel. And then finally on this point, please don't forget the absence of the word default, which is commonly added uh, in cargo trade time charter parties as a sort of catch-all to cover not, cover not just strikes, but a refusal by the master to comply with orders. It's another possible amendment. Now, my next topic, liability for vessel not working, was another provision crying out for amendment uh, from the 2005 form. As it stood, it was debatable whether or not the clause was effective to exclude damages for negligence. Applying orthodox principles of contractual construction and the very highest authority, namely, of course, Rainey on the law of tug and tow and offshore contracts, the answer to that question is a clear no. But there was a well-known arbitration case which held that the words any loss and by any cause whatsoever are wide enough to exclude negligence. So the new form needed to clear this up, and it has. But who was going to win? Charterers or owners? Charterers would have wanted something like, with the exception of negligence on the part of a member of owners' group, but as you can see from the slide, it was owners who got their way. Even if their crew have been negligent, damages for delay are limited to the daily rate. And may I just suggest you note those new last words in the clause, applying it to delays which were breach but not off hire as well, as well as to off hire delays. Again, in my view, worth noting. Now my last topic. I've headed it time, gentlemen, please, not in relation to my, speak, my talk time, but in relation to what may be the death knell or the end and the calling of time on maintenance days. I never could understand the maintenance day freebie for owners under the 1989 and 2005 forms. Why should owners get a sort of reverse address commission, which has been known to mount up to big six-figure sums payable on redelivery? A nice little lollipop, I used to call it, a, an extra day a month. Owners rarely use their maintenance days and take advantage of charterers' downtime periods to carry out maintenance and repairs. And when not lecturing on the 2005 form, I found that it was this provision which people, both owners and charterers, got most worked up about. Well, the party appears to be over and BIMCO have call time, to an extent anyway. What we have now... Uh, and looking at the slide and seeing the comparison between the two clauses, is this. Owners still do get their one-day-a-month maintenance day, and accumulation of those days is permitted. Uh, uh, and it's up to them whether or not they use them. But owners no longer get to accumulate a day-a-month extra higher for maintenance days, which, of course, as we know, are rarely used. Whenever they do use them, hire, though, is payable, but the charterers to provide provisions are suspended. In other words, it's as if in this respect only the vessel were off hire. But, 
and this is the important final provision, for those days when owners have given notice to use and charterers have requested that they should not be used, then hire is accumulating for those days and is payable on delivery. Now, I just want you to look at the, the last little bit at the bottom of my slide, which is that we still have an assumption built into Clause 13 that were it not for the maintenance day allowance, the vessel would be off hire when working is prevented because she is carrying out routine maintenance or repairs, or now, the additional word, surveys. But why? Those activities, as I see it, I'm happy to be given a red face by BIMCO, do not fall within any of the off-hire categories. The assumption, it seems to me, is an erroneous one, and the words notwithstanding subclause th sub 13a are at best confusing. So, back to accumulated maintenance days <coughs> higher. Is the party rarely over? Has time been called? I just want to go through very la quickly, lastly, an example. Say we have a one-year time charter, plus or minus one month charter's option. No maintenance days are used. They accumulate, and we get to month 10. So owners have banked nine days, which theoretically they can only use as maintenance days for maintenance and repair. But the vessel is busy in the field with a full schedule. Owners give notice, reasonable notice, that in two weeks' time they're going to take the vessel out for nine days for maintenance and repairs. They know very well that on their timing that there's no way that charters will be able to give permission uh, for that. So they've taken a quick punt. Uh, they knew they weren't being, going to be given their nine days accumulated maintenance. Bingo. They get their nine days as higher. Well, I think they do. I'd be interested if you agree. So, to conclude, Clause 13, we have evolution rather than revolution. It is, to my mind, a better clause and certainly fitter for purpose, though, as you've heard, with respect, I fear I still have my reservations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Simon. Now looking at our off-hire provision. Now our final speaker for this evening is Robert Gay, I think self-styled enfant terrible, of, if I pronounce that correctly, of supply time. Um, I think I, uh, Robert first came to my attention when I read a paper called The Perils and Pitfalls of Using Supply Time. Um, which was a very interesting read for us at BIMCO, certainly. So uh, we will indeed be very interested to hear what uh, Robert has to say about what we've done to this edition. So, Robert. I wanted to start by saying, look, why do we have an early termination for cause provision in this form? Well, one reason's just style. This is halfway between a charter party and an oil and gas industry contract. In an oil and gas industry contract, you have a provision saying about early termination for cause, so we have one here. The second reason is, and I'll come back to this to an extent, because it's one of the standards by which you might assess this clause, that there's an aim in supply time to make things explicit, not to have what might be called the decent obscurities, not to have the working of the contract depend on implied terms that aren't spelt out. The third reason is because English law in some respects sets the, bound, the, the, the hurdles that have to be jumped high and difficult. Anyone who can give me a brief, clear explanation of when a breach of contract of an innominate term is a repudiatory breach, I would very much welcome it because I'm trying to write a book. <laughs> um, so it seems to me there were three main areas that the people drafting the 2017 version were trying to attend to within this clause. The first was the procedure with two notices. The first notice was trying to do two jobs and it got very snarled up basically because it was trying both to give information and to give a warning saying, watch out, I'm going to terminate. But one person had the information, the other person had... Right, I'm not going there. The second was because there were problems about the provision which there then was for early termination in case of what was called breakdown. The third problem was because in the previous versions, repudiatory breach of contract came within the two-notice procedure. Now, big change. Now, the first notice is only doing one job. 
to warn. Most of the complications and snarl-ups have gone. There's a list of termination events. Some of them haven't changed. The following have problems with them. If you want to know what the problems are, you're going to have to buy the book. But they've added one where if owners don't have the required insurances. And I thought I should maybe speak a moment about that. The first notice is only warning. There's no duty to give information. There's no duty on the owners to tell the charterers if their insurance has lapsed or is cancelled. If you as the charterer want to know that the owners have insurance, you need to call for certificates. And if it's a long-term time charter, you better note the expiry date because you're going to have to call for fresh certificates when the old ones expire. But what happens if the owners don't pay their club, their club calls? What happens if they don't pay their premiums? What happens if their insurance gets cancelled? I don't see anything where the charterers have to tell the owners. I don't see anything either where the owners are in a position to insist that the insurers must give an undertaking to tell the charterers if the insurers are going to cancel the insurance. That might be covered by saying that the owners are to be named as co-insured if they wish. Sorry, the charters are to be called named as co-insured if they wish. I don't know whether as a market practice that gives you the same rights as in an undertaking to be notified before cancellation. On the other hand, somebody's going to say to me, well, it's all very well, Mr Gay, but this won't do much good in practice. Confession, I had an arbitration award once in which QC said, confession is not a normal practice in the shipping industry. <laughs> this was about the previous version of supply time where the owners were under duty to tell the charterers that their vessel had broken down. In practice, you'd end up with trying to claim damages for failing to tell me that your insurance has been cancelled. And the problem with that is, well, either an insured event has happened if it, or it hasn't. If it hasn't happened, the damages are nominal. If it has happened, the owners aren't going to be able to pay the damages anyway. So you might... Period of warning. Used to be three clear days. It's now 14. Um, Good period to get fresh insurance policies. Quite long if you, as charterer, don't want to use the vessel while she's not insured. Also makes sense in the case of the force majeure termination provision because the first notice can now be given as soon as the force majeure happens and we've got 14 days waiting to see if it clears up. Um, for some of the others, makes less sense. 14 days to stop the vessel being lost. 14 days to get rid of the vexatious bankruptcy position, but also 14 days for the administrators or the debtor in possession under Chapter 11 to take the necessary proceedings to stop you from terminating. <coughs> Tidying up, there's no big problem, any case time limit when the first notice can be given. There's no decent obscurity implication that the second notice needs to be given promptly. We're told when it must be given. I think not be completely tidied up. I think you need to be in the mindset of English law to know that the first notice needs to be given reasonably promptly after you find out about a termination event. I think if you read the wording, the second notice can only be given after the, four, the 14 days are up. But I notice that I think Grant doesn't agree with me there. And I think that when Grant and I disagree, somebody's going to have an expensive argument. And it says, with immediate effect, but it doesn't mean it. Right. Second of these reforms. Goodbye breakdown. And hello, the sort of termination for excess off hire that we're fairly used to in charter parties of cargo vessels, in particular when they're being chartered for use in a liner service, container vessels. Um, I'll skip the problems, and I'll try to talk about the solutions. 
You might want as an owner not to have your vessel terminated because she was doing her job and her job involved doing risky things and she's had a collision or something like that. I think that under this off hire termination provision that can happen. We've got clarity now about what are the days in a way that we didn't when we were trying to count breakdown days under the old versions. But I as a charterer if my the, the vessel I'm chartering has stopped work for 20 days, I'm not particularly interested in whether the owners are using up their maintenance days or not. What I want to know is, am I going to be able to use this vessel because I've got everything else waiting for her? You can manipulate off hire. There's an arbitration somewhere, I can't remember the reference, where people change the service required in order to make sure that she stays off hire for long enough to terminate her. Um, Simon points out that off hire under the supply time is 100%, but the parties may still in practice have a system of haggling by which in practice they've been agreeing partial off hires. And that's going to make a big mess when somebody comes to do an off hire termination. Have they succeeded in informally varying a contract which says it can only be varied in writing under signature? Answers on the back of a postcard. And then, if they have varied the contract so they can have partial up higher, if she's 50% off higher, is she 20 days consecutive off higher, 10 days, or no days? I think 10 days, but I also think somebody's going to have an argument about it. Um, there's now no warning notice. This is taken out of the whole warning notice procedure. If I were an owner, I'd like to be warned. If I put in a substitute vessel, does she start with a clean sheet? Or does the aggregate <coughs> of hire accumulated by the original vessel get carried forward? I genuinely don't know the answer to that one. It seems to me that it's a little bit of a cop-out, and I apologise for the vulgar term, that the people drafting this, for whom personally I have great respect, Ian Perrett is a good mate of mine also, they saw that breakdown had problems. Rather than getting stuck in and tackling the problems, they said, well, let's just go for something else. That would be more straightforward. Well, actually, it may turn out not to be much more straightforward. Unless somebody gives me the answer to the clear definition of repudiatory breach, this is part of the decent obscurities. You need to have been reading the law reports for five years. And I don't just mean summaries. You need to have read the judgments. And then you might have an intuitive sense for what is and isn't a repudiation breach. In the old versions, it was under the notice provision. That made problems because you could, it takes clear words to give up a common law right. So we've given up on that. And we're not quite clear on think about what the consequences of termination for repudiatory breach are under this form and whether I can still terminate for repudiatory breach outside the form and have a different set of consequences which might be better for me so perhaps I shall do it inside the form and outside the form. I personally, I might have split them into remediable breaches and non-remediable ones and the remedial reaches, I might set the hurdle deliberately low and say the ground for termination is going to be failure to remedy, not the original breach. But with ones that are alleged to be non-remediable, I might put it high and I might try defining it high. I might take the words which I think are too strong for repudiatory breach as a matter of the general law, and say substantially the whole benefit. You know that phrase. Um, but I think that's a bit pie in the sky. So that brings us uh, to the end of our, our speakers uh, this evening. We do have some time left over for questions, and we would indeed welcome any questions or comments or shared experiences. Are there any questions, Tom? Yes, sir. Simon, you like to return that one on the uh, hazardous substances? Well, we'll get one of the Simons. We'll get one Simon. We'll get both Simons if you want. It hasn't been taken out, of course. Uh, 14F has been taken out. It's been removed from the knock for knock. Mm. The amendment to the hazardous substances is a very sensible one 
because it used to be hazardous and at all noxious substances. It is now hazardous and noxious substances. Uh, it, it was un most unsatisfactory in its old form, and it's now been tidied up, and it's an excellent form. So don't worry, Edward. It's, it's, it's still there, but it's just been removed from knock for knock. Well, I'm not sure that really is the answer to the question, is it? Because if you're, you're, you're concerned that if your, your crew is um, uh, killed or your vessel is damaged by a hazardous and noxious substance, uh, uh, you're gonna have, you as the owner will have to carry the can for that, uh, 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 whereas the, under the old regime you could say, well, it's true, I bear knock for knock, and it's true I look after my own vessel and my own crew, but not when the cause is the carriage of your hazardous or noxious stuff, or... Uh, dangerous goods or explosive materials. I think the option is for an owner in a strong position would be to uh, uh, amend and have a rider clause. Can I tip you in a moment? I mean, Edward, I think part of this is that the way supply time is in theory supposed to work is that the obligation to take care, to have the risk assessments, to do all that stuff gets completely separated from the liability regime. It's, if I can say so, it's a standard way of thinking in ordinary cargo shipping that the way to make sure that people take care is to make their insurers liable if they don't. But supply time basically only works if you're willing to sever that link. If you're willing to say, we trust our charterers to take care, but if they don't take care then we want our insurers to take it away so that we don't end up suing each other. And if you're not willing to sever that link, then you probably shouldn't be agreeing a knock-for-knock knock at mm. all. I think Robert makes a very important point. I mean, the, the, the problem with knock-for-knock knock is uh, everyone, when they're drafting the contract and setting, s s settling down to conclude the contract, think, what a great idea. We're not going to have any claims between each other. Uh, it's all going to be laid off into insurance. Uh, we're going to have it, there's going to be a sunny uplands of, of contractual cooperation. Something goes terribly wrong, uh, and all of the people on this table are, are then asked to pick over the knock for knock clause to think of any argument ap at all to get out of it. So uh, I think that Robert is absolutely right. Uh, it, it, when you're signing up to one of these BIMCO contracts with knock for knock at the heart, sometimes the knock for knock in the older forms isn't perfect. It's getting better and better. I think it is reaching a, a, a state of near perfection uh, with the supply time uh, 2017 form. It, you have to recognize what you're signing up to. Uh, and it is, you know, I, I know all of us on this table will have met clients in con or at a meeting at uh, solicitor's offices saying, but hold on a minute. Uh, my vessel sank or blew up or, or, or the, 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 the crew were killed and I've suffered this liability. Uh, and, without, and then you say, well, look at Clause 14, but it can't mean that. Uh, and that's a slightly odd uh, concept. So I think Robert's absolutely right. You need, to, you need to know what the philosophy is you're signing up to uh, uh, um, and perhaps uh, on the sort of offshore providers, the, uh, the clients and contractors, are more used to um, a, a pure knock-for-knock regime than uh, marine operators, but um, there's been plenty of time to get used to it. I think the rationale for ending up where we did on it was because these provisions are primarily relevant when uh, vessels are carrying cargo, and for the most part, support vessels aren't usually carrying cargo, uh, and therefore I've, I've never come across a situation where one gets into the effect and impact of both the blame collision call or indeed general average in an OSV um, uh, uh, casualty. Um, and it was felt that it had, these provisions had been in the previous forms and it was rather something of a historical um, anachronism, really. Um, and the general feeling was that they were of, of little practical or no real practical um, importance. So, so he hence they were removed. Now, there was some thought that um, uh, for vessels uh, operating in U.S. waters, particularly with regard to the both to blame collision clause, there might be a greater need for it, but that was rather a more confined thing, given we were trying to primarily produce something um, that had a more general application. Um, we left that for parties to bring it back in if they felt that it, 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 it might be needed or it might be relevant, given 
the particular circumstances of a charter and, and where it was operating and if indeed it was carrying cargo. The way BIMCO works, the way we develop uh, contracts and clauses is that we always ensure that one of the people on the drafting team is from a P&I club. Uh, and that's been the case for over 100 years with BIMCO. For us, it's of paramount importance that nothing we produce is going to prejudice the P&I club. So we always make sure the P&I clubs are involved. On our documentary committee, which is the oversight body that ultimately approves for publication all our contracts and clauses, we have most of the members of the international <coughs> So it's not a direct separate approval by them. They form part of our documentary committee and therefore part of the formal approval process. So I would say yes, they have given their back in the Okay, well that remains uh, for me just to thank our panel members, Chris Kidd, Simon Ramey, uh, Gemma Morgan, Simon Ferndell and Robert Gay. Thank you all for attending this evening. Hope you found it useful and informative. I certainly have and I'm very pleased with the outcome of the discussions. And I hope you'll all join us for a drink afterwards. Thank you very much.